Okay, so when we last left our heroes, uh, we had reached a sort of fragile compromise in which some constitutional changes had been made, uh, some significant gains had been made for some groups, uh, other groups such as women, and of course, most white Southerners were somewhat less happy with this, and Reconstruction had been partially successful. Uh, today we're going to look at Southerners' pushback against Reconstruction and how they more or less systematically dismantled the entire system over the second half of Ulysses Grant's presidency. So, for the first time in American history, the representatives from the Southern states somewhat more or reflected in a more accurate way the population of those states. This meant that we got the first African Americans elected to Congress and or to the House of Representatives and to the Senate, and we started seeing the first African American governors. And so because African Americans had the vote, they started voting for you know, leading citizens of who represented their constituencies, and so we got the first black congressional delegation and the first black governor in the United States. Uh, that was the governor of Louisiana at the time. And so just to uh, show you exactly how groundbreaking this was, the second black governor of the United States was elected in 1980. So it's going to take another 100 years to uh, get to the place that we were in the 1870s. So uh, for the first time ever, African Americans are being elected to national office. And this is going to, of course, be very promising for African Americans in the South, but of course lead to significant pushback from mostly racists. The Freedmen's Bureau also was providing some pretty significant gains for African Americans. They were providing uh, job training and uh, education. They would cre uh, provide food and clothing and try to basically transition former slaves from their status of slavery, where they had very few rights or privileges or anything else, into being productive members of society. And so some significant gains had been made through the Freedmen's Bureau. For Southerners, there was significant pushback against this, uh, specifically against the Freedmen's Bureau and uh, Northerners who came down to help uh, African Americans assimilate into society, and Southerners who were complicit in the process. Uh, for the Southerners, uh, they referred to these Northerners who came south as carpetbaggers. Uh, their basic assertion was that these were opportunists who were coming down in order to take advantage of the South's weakened state. Uh, they called them carpetbaggers because they brought their belongings down in these cheap suitcases known as carpet bags, and they vilified them relatively uh, widely. And Southerners who participated with these Reconstruction governments were known as scallywags, and we're going to see some pretty significant vigilante justice meted out against both groups. The main way that Southerners, or the main way that Reconstruction failed to profoundly change Southern society is the system of sharecropping and crop lien. So sharecropping is an economic system that developed after the Civil War because although significant political and social gains were given to African Americans, uh, for most freed slaves there was very little economic gain. Uh, Sherman may have promised 40 acres and a mule to every freed slave as he marched through Georgia. But once his troops withdraw, withdrew, the federal government was very wary about uh, redistributing property or actually providing land to former slaves, which left them, for the most part, economically dependent on the same masters that they had been dependent on previously. The sharecropping system is relatively simple. For most freed slaves, they had no prospects, and so they very quickly had to either leave the South, which a number of which large numbers of them did during this time period, or they had to go into uh, some sort of contract with their former owners who owned most of the property. So the sharecropping system is pretty simple. First, a sharecropper is provided land and seed by the land owner. And in exchange, he's going to farm the land, and then when harvest time comes, provide the owner with half the crops. But the problem is, the sharecropper doesn't have any income during the whole time, the whole season of farming. So he's, in order to feed himself and his family, or herself or her family, and have clothing or anything else, they're going to have to buy that on credit from the landowner. So the sharecropper does the harvesting, sells the crop, 
and with the idea that they'll get half the earnings, uh, was subtracted, of course, for any sort of expenditures they had throughout the year. Uh, by the end of the year, the landowner informs the sharecropper that, well, you did make some money, but you didn't make enough money to cover your debts for the food and clothing. So next year, we're going to take more of your crop than we did the previous year, and the cycle just continues. So sharecroppers dig themselves into a basic a cycle of poverty and that they can never really escape meaning that uh, sharecroppers are not enslaved, but economically they are entirely dependent on their owners and there's really no way to get out from under this cycle of poverty and debt. So not slavery, but some similarities to the system of slavery. Uh, so when we get pictures of sharecroppers working in fields, they start to look very, very similar two pictures that you would have gotten just 10 years ago with uh, slaves working in fields. The difference, of course, is there's no overseer, there's no buying and selling, there's no, you know, slaves can have social lives, or sharecroppers can have social lives and can have uh, some economic power and some social freedom, but economically still marginalized, to say the least. So Southerners then started attacking the social and political gains uh, achieved by normal, by uh, newly freed men. We start seeing a lot of propaganda from the South uh, attacking these institutions that had started to build up and integrate uh, former slaves into society. Uh, this is propaganda against the Freedmen's Bureau, showing a lazy African-American theoretically lounging around getting federal help where poor white people uh, you know, struggle and suffer completely ignoring, of course, the fact that poor white people had not been previously enslaved. And so, but again, it's racist propaganda that would have appealed to a variety of different racists. They also attacked the newly uh, elected African-American representatives, depicting them as, you know, unfit for legislative duty and uh, corrupt and uh, not able to uh, handle the rigors of legislation. All of this was, for the most part, utter nonsense. Uh, there was no, they were equally skilled legislators or equally talented legislators as most of their white colleagues. And they were no more corrupt than your average white representative. But many people were willing to believe the inherent inferiority of African Americans because it played on their already established racial stereotypes. And so these were, these pro pieces of propaganda were relatively effective in convincing people that these causes were not worth fighting for which of course is what the South is trying to do. The goal for the South is to get the North to give up trying to po push social, political, and economic change upon them, and this propaganda is one step towards attempting to do that. So in order to reinforce social norms, the Southerners turned to terrorism. Uh, the number of secret societies were created. Uh, the White League, of course, was one, but uh, the most well-known is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, also known as the Invisible Empire, was a secret society whose goal was to force African Americans out of public spaces and uh, through the use of fear and vigilante violence to reassert white supremacy throughout the country. The Klan also, of course, attacked Northerners who came south. You can clearly see a carpet bag there and uh, an implicit threat to Northerners that if they stay in southern states, violence may be meted out against them. And of course, because the membership was theoretically anonymous, it was very difficult to track down these Klansmen. And if they were captured slash prosecuted, uh, they'd be tried by usually juries that would also be either filled with Klan members or intimidated by Klan members. All of this led to uh, basically the forcing of African Americans back into a subservient social position. Uh, you can see this national propaganda from Thomas Nast, who we'll spend some time talking about next semester, arguing that uh, the, this rash of terrorism put African Americans in a more vulnerable position than they were under slavery, and that many of the gains of Reconstruction were being lost. There was some national outcry over the, use of, uh, over the use of vigilante violence in the South, and some of the propaganda, like Thomas Nast's, uh, did help convince some Northerners that they needed to act. The Grant administration passed the Klan Act, 
which attempted to provide more federal enforcement, making Klan activities a federal crime rather than a state crime, theoretically moving the prosecution of these, of these atrocities into federal courts where there was less likely to be corrupt juries and it would be much more difficult to physically and uh, socially intimidate uh, judges into ruling against them. And so there was some prosecution of the Klan, but it was limited and the lack of cooperation of local officials made it incredibly difficult to root out Klan activity. So what ended up happening then is the Klan was able to start politically intimidating African Americans and potential Republican voters. Uh, because of course ballots were not secret and you had to vote in open, uh, there was a lot of voter intimidation, especially by the Klan. Uh, African Americans who voted would be targeted and their families would be targeted. And there was just significant amounts of voter fraud. Uh, I believe the caption for this picture is, of course he wants to vote for the Democratic ticket. What this means is that by 1872, southern states had mostly fallen back into democratic rule, African Americans had been starting to be marginalized from southern society, and many of the gains that Reconstruction had brought had been beginning to unravel. So for the election of 1872, Grant is going to run again, but he's going to be running under a cloud of scandal. Grant's administration was hopelessly corrupt. Uh, specifically, speculative deals involving railroads were very common, although there was a lot of graft throughout a number of different sections of the government. Uh, corruption in the Navy, corruption in the post office, and uh, corruption in tax collection all started weighing down General Grant's potential re-election uh, opportunities. Uh, Grant did, to some extent, try to stomp out these scandals, but the combination of uh, his, have, his propensity for heavy drinking, coupled with the widespread corruption throughout his administration, meant that when he crushed one potential scandal, other scandals just simply popped up. And I will add as an aside, President Grant makes a fantastic elephant stomping around trying to, trying to destroy corrupt chickens. In the end, the Democrats didn't even run a national candidate in the election of 72. Uh, Grant ran as a Republican, and former radical Republican and New York newspaper publisher Horace Greeley also ran as a Republican. This is one of the strangest elections in American history because after the popular vote was cast, but before the electoral vote was cast, Horace Greeley died. And so, what this meant is that despite the fact that Grant was a relatively weak candidate, uh, the Credit Mobilier scandal had absolutely crippled him. This is one of the most famous scandals in American history. Uh, it was wealthy uh, industrialists paying off members of Congress in order to gain uh, license to develop Western land, and, uh, and then, yeah. So despite that massive scandal, which we'll talk more about next unit, uh, Grant is able to win re-election because Greeley is, of course, dead. He got four, so Horace Greeley got 44% of the electoral vote, or the popular vote, but of course uh, a small, only a small percentage of the electoral vote on the count of the fact that he was dead. And so uh, most, <laughs> so all the states that went for Grant, of course, went for Grant, and the states that went for Greeley were divided up amongst a variety of other people, with, of course, you know, Georgia voting three times for Greeley despite his death. So Grant's second term basically accomplished nothing and achieved nothing. He was mostly dealing with these uh, issues of corruption. And so for the election of 1876, the Republicans were in a significantly weakened position. Republicans nominated former Civil War General Rutherford B. Hayes, whereas Democrats nominated Samuel Tilden. Neither of these candidates were uh, particularly inspiring. And so the end result is an election that was incredibly fraudulent. Uh, we're going to get into the fraudulence of this election in the North a little bit uh, next unit, but uh, political machines uh, played a large role in stuffing ballot boxes and basically uh, subverting the popular vote from northern cities. Whereas in southern cities and southern states, they simply sold their electoral votes. As you can see, uh, this election was incredibly close. Most of the South has now gone back to the Democrats in this election. And the three states that didn't 
only didn't because their pop the results of their popular vote were thrown out and massive bribes were given to their outgoing legislatures to give the electoral votes to Hayes instead. Uh, this corruption was relatively obvious to everybody. So a commission was put together in order to investigate this clearly fraudulent election. And this commission had seven Republicans on it and six Democrats. And so they ruled that the election was legitimate and that Hayes would become president of the United States. This, of course, led to massive outrage amongst the Democrats because this is probably the most blatant election stealing that we've seen so far in American history. And so uh, obviously there was significant pushback and talks of another rebellion or at least you know, terrorist activities or yeah, significant pushback from, Republican, from Democrats against this clear Republican corruption. And uh, Rutherford B. Hayes would be known forever, forever there after as Rutherford Fraud B. Hayes. And uh, his administration would be clearly hampered by the obviously corrupt way in which he became president. So the way that Republicans mollified Democrats is through something called the Compromise of 1877 where Republicans in Congress agree, told the Democrats that if the Democrats would stop agitating about the clearly corrupt and stolen election of 76, Republicans would vote to remove federal troops from the South and end Reconstruction. And so, whereas uh, under President Grant, of course, uh, Southern law and Southern, uh, or Southern, Southern society was dominated by Northern military troops, which protected African-American voting rights and attempted to stop Klan activity. Here you see the Hayes administration uh, plowing over those carpet bags. And from the Southerners perspective, everything going back to normal and the status quo. But from the perspective of Union soldiers, of course, or anyone who was an advocate for African-Americans, they're basically simply capitulating and allowing the South to re-enslave African Americans in all but name. And so with the work of Reconstruction somewhat unfinished, Northern troops are removed, and it's going to take another 40 years before anyone starts really agitating uh, to try to push for change within the Southern states. And so in many ways, the Civil War was a vast change in American society. And in many other ways, Southern society after the war somewhat mirrored Southern society before the war.